I'm your number one fan. We all go a little mad sometimes. Whatever you do. Hello, happy Hi. Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Welcome back to Killer Katie's podcast. Welcome. I'm so excited to talk about I Saw the TV Glow. <laughs> you sound like an NPC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am so excited to talk about <laughs> Um, uh but, yeah should we do news first yeah yeah I, right. i'll kick us off <laughs> okay roger corman mm -hmm. he was a legendary filmmaker who was often referred to as the king of the bees as in bee movies he was behind little shop of horrors and attack of the crab monsters he's passed away at 98 years old he was a pillar in the horror community really the movie community John Carpenter tweeted on the night that Roger passed, saying that Roger was one of the most influential movie directors in John's life, a great friend, and someone who shaped John's childhood. So large praise coming from John Carpenter. For sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely a, a sad loss. Yeah. But 98. That's a big full life. Yeah, for sure. Um, on my end, switching gears entirely... <laughs> um, <laughs> A 39-second teaser has been released for an upcoming movie called The Substance, which is going to star Demi Moore. Oh. Uh, the movie has been described as an explosive feminist take on body horror. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. So if you want to see the teaser, it is on Deadline.com. Something tells me I'm not going to enjoy that. Oh. Something tells me I might. <laughs> feminist body horror? That sounds terrible. Oh. That sounds like I don't want to watch that. Sounds like ter like, I like terrible do. as in like you know. Yeah. Eesh. Okay. Well, I thought Demi Moore was retired too. Yeah, I can't think of anything she's been in recently. Maybe this is her renaissance. Yeah, I don't. I'm. I'll be honest and say like I don't really keep up with her work, so <laughs> she could have been doing a lot of things that I would probably have no idea. But yeah, fair. Um, okay, I've got a tiny one. Okay. It's very niche. But what? I thought it was interesting because I saw it on TikTok. Uh, Madeline Petch, Pesh, mm -hmm. you know, from The Strangers Chapter One. Yes. She did an interview. She revealed that the axe scene from the trailer and from the movie, obviously, where she's got her face up against the door and the axe, that was not CGI. And her scream was real. Her head was on the door and there was a person on the other side of the door with an axe that chopped entirely through the wood next to her face. Hell yeah, brother. Yeah. We love a good practical. We do. Although I'm sad. A lot of people said that movie was A, yes. So. We'll be the judges of that. And we'll probably agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, last one for me. Um, Sony Pictures has announced that the next sequel in the I Know What You Did Last Summer franchise already has a release date. Oh. It's set for July 18th in 2025. I didn't even know that they were having another movie in that franchise. <laughs> how, what, how, what movie is this? What number? Um, technically the fourth, but a lot of people don't talk about the third one. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's said that Jennifer Love Hewitt and Freddie Prince Jr. are in talks to reprise their roles. So nothing's been officially confirmed yet, but... I think Jennifer Love Hewitt said like earlier this year that she would be down, but she hasn't seen a script or anything. So who's to say? So confident to have a release date of a movie you haven't even cast yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> tune in in a few episodes when we announce that that movie has been pushed back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, as the NPC at the beginning of the episode said, we're here to talk about I Saw the TV Glow. From the mouth of the director, Jane Schoenbrunn, I Saw the TV Glow is a movie about two lonely teenagers who find each other through their shared love of a strange kind of scary, kind of sweet TV show. They get together every week to watch it, but when their obsession gets out of hand, their sense of reality gets called into question. 
It stars Justice Smith as Owen and Bridget Lundy Payne as Maddie. It just released May 2024, has a 6.8 currently out of 10 on IMDb and a 65% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes and 84% certified fresh critic score. Certified fresh. By the critics, not by the audience. By the critics. <laughs> yeah, when I saw this, in, I saw this in theaters on um, Thursday of last week, I think. Mm-hmm. Right? It doesn't matter. And at that point, it had a like 98% critic score and like a 20 percent audience score there was a huge discrepancy so that's a little bit more aligned now but sheesh yeah the, the initial audiences did not enjoy this movie yeah well i guess like the initial audiences who went on to review um yeah i i saw this yesterday and the, as soon as the credits rolled, like everybody just kind of sat there for a minute in silence. <laughs> like everybody was like, "Wait, <laughs> what?" And then I was like the first person to get up and go, um, because as a like a behind the scenes for, for the listeners, I have this thing I like to call cave girl hours, <laughs> where I my body just like won't let me sleep, and so I sleep for like four hour increments at most, and that's been happening for like a week and a half. <laughs> So I'm already, like, not in a great, like, <laughs> mental fortitude spot. And I knew, I was like, oh, I'm going to start crying. And so I literally <laughs> power walked to my car and sobbed the entire way home. And then, like, four hours later, I was still crying. And I was like, guys, somebody send help because I don't know what's happening. Oof. <laughs> Yeah, this gave me kind of an existential crisis. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah. See, now you know how I feel after watching everything everywhere all at once. That's exactly what happened to me. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, this one this one hit a little differently. And again, I'm very tired. So that's probably like didn't help the not situation. But... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if it makes you feel any better, I was very well rested when I saw this. And then I sent our like core group of friends a very long-winded confused <laughs> snapchat as i was walking out of the theater <laughs> um yeah it it definitely made you feel something i cried at the end in the theater shamelessly i don't know why you had to leave to cry but i don't know you were tired i think yeah and i think i'd like knew i had time i was like okay <laughs> <laughs> if if i can get somewhere let's go <laughs> yeah but yeah, I thought it was funny. You were, uh, she was telling us a story in Snapchat that had nothing to do with the movie. But like every once in a while, you'd just be like, and I just saw this movie and I can't. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and that was before I'd seen it. So I was like, what's going on in this movie? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that ending was something. Yeah. I knew I was, yeah. I almost teared up. Well, I did kind of tear up in the theater when he was at the birthday party and just like, breaks down and starts like screaming <laughs> yes yeah that that was the part where i was like oh i'm cooked <laughs> it's happening <laughs> yeah for for those that don't know the the director and, and the cast everybody has said everybody that had a part in this movie has said that this is a trans allegory about like wearing a mask and figuring out a way to take off the mask and kind of be your true self. Mm -hmm. um, I don't relate to that, obviously, specifically, but very similarly, I think almost identical. I read more of it. I read it more as a, like, just very high level, how to find happiness. Mm. And at the end, when he's like kind of cutting himself out and like, he's like shining from inside. I was like, oh my God, like he can be happy now. And go on with his life and live his true life. I don't know. I, I read into it obviously a little bit differently. But funny how yeah. like that is very much what coming out being trans is about. Is you're stuck in a body you don't want to be in. Or in a mindset you don't want to be in. And you have to go yeah. through all of this in order to find, you know, or announce, be your true self. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to speak more, you know... <laughs> 
Yeah. No, I like it though because this is a movie that can be interpreted in like a thousand different ways. Totally. And at its core, yes, like the director has even said that they were going, like they were working through dysphoria and beginning their transition. So mm -hmm. this movie kind of aligned with that. Um, and I think they even said that this is a movie about recognizing something that's wrong and about the process that goes into that recognition. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you know, you're not trans, I do think that that's something that is relatable to a lot of people. Um, and yeah, I, I'm not trans, so I can't relate to that part. But I do think that it was kind of a, a broad enough experience that a lot of people in the LGBT community or period can relate to that. Uh, but yeah, I kind of saw it as, I, well, one interpretation that I read was that Maddie and Owen were both like st substitutes for people dealing with gender dysphoria mm -hmm. and Maddie choosing to live out their life truly, whereas Owen decided to go with what society expects them to do. And then realizing mm -hmm. slowly that like, that was not... <laughs> the choice that he should have made yeah um so i thought that was really interesting as well really and uh, oh, i mean the, the movie is also very literal in that the director said that the way that they dealt with you know being kind of stuck is relating to or finding characters in pop culture i'll let you talk about exactly which characters because i know you want to um and and i mean that's exactly what's happening in the movie right is is the maddie is literally relating to the tv show by going and being a part of the tv show so yeah well and that's the thing that, i think why this movie can resonate with a lot of people even if you're not trans or not in the community like just having things that are so nostalgic and and relating so much to them and having that be such a big part of your life. And then also, if you can't stop the passage of time and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. you're 40 years old and you rewatch these things and they don't hit the same way and everything's different and you can't stop it. And now I'm going to start spiraling again. <laughs> but yeah, man. <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the director, Jane, also said that uh, when they write a script, it typically starts with just an idea that, get lodged, that gets lodged in their brain. Mm -hmm. um, and it's never a fully fledged idea. It's just like one thing. Um, and with this, they said it was the idea of being haunted by an unresolved cliffhanger in a cho children's show, and specifically those characters in the show being in danger, um, and just that feeling of not having that resolution, making it really hard to exist in the real world, to mm -hmm. the point where you're almost taking on the pain of the characters in the show. Been yeah. there. Yeah. Um, a another thing that I thought about. Mm -hmm. it's a, I don't, I'm trying to be a lot more eloquent than I am, and I'm just not. So, um, just take it for what it is. I feel like this movie really personified that like pit in your stomach feeling that you get when you finish a series, whether it's a book or a show or whatever. You know that feeling where you're just like, "What the fuck do I do now?" Yeah, I, like this movie personified that for me, and and 100%. I got the same feeling without. Without ever, like, without knowing anything about the movie, without ever having experienced the world of, like, the movie or the Pink Opaque or whatever, after the movie was over, that is how I felt. I felt like I had just finished the Twilight series and I was 17 years old. Or I had just, you know, I don't know, walked out of the last Hunger Games movie. I don't know. I'm, I'm doing a very bad job of, of No, but you're, it made you, like, nostalgic for something you've never even experienced. Exactly. Like, it was so weird. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i the, i yeah i got done and i came home and i was crying and i started reading through letterbox reviews which didn't help because some of the people said like the most beautiful things about <laughs> like how it relates to that and nostalgia and this feeling of despair and melancholy and like going through your life and the passage of time and i was just reading through these reviews crying even harder and i was mm -hmm. like <sighs> cancel the podcast we can't do this <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, it took us a lot of time to like build up the momentum to even start recording this morning. <laughs> which, by the way, fun fact, it's morning. It is morning, which I feel like is easier to it's easier to tell when we record in the daytime from my perspective yes. because I can't block out the sun. <laughs> yeah, I can. So yes, it is daytime, but also, yeah, we we were like, oh, we'll record at ten. It's eleven now, so yeah. <laughs> and we're like fifteen minutes. In. Yeah, yes. <laughs> it's like that scene in Bambi too. <laughs> Where Bambi's like, one, two, two. That's I've what we did. Never seen Bambi too. You don't need to. That's what I think. <laughs> I mean, after the first, that, yeah, that movie was too sad for me as a kid. Yeah. I did not like sad movies as a kid. Yeah. And then we grow up, and that's sad movies, yay. Yeah, now I watch this, and I'm like, should I go see it again? <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, I'm just gonna start touching on some of the inspirations for this because you and I both know that I want to talk about it anyway. <laughs> yeah, so, might as well um, start now. Yes, the Pinko Pink is the TV show in the movie that the the two kids are like obsessed with. <laughs> um, which, by the way, any anybody out there who has TV connections. Chop, chop. Let's get it rolling, because I would love to watch the Pinko Pig. Yeah. That shit would have been my jam. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, some of the fictional television shows that it was inspired by were uh, The Secret World of Alec Mack, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and Are You Afraid of the Dark? Those were the ones officially listed. I also feel like there was definitely some Twin Peaks in there. Um just Isn't that newer? the vibes. No, Twin Peaks is is an old show that got like a reboot. Oh, got it. Yeah. Um old. I think it was the 90s. <laughs> well, old. I guess that's old now. Yeah. Um but yes, so definitely I I think that's also maybe why it hit so hard for me was because like I am also obsessed with a show that this show is based off of, right? Mm -hmm. So um so yeah, I definitely could tell in the movie that it was inspired, that that was part of the inspiration for it. And then they decided to just like slap it right in my fucking face because <laughs> throughout the film, in order to watch the show, Owen's character keeps lying to his parents and being like, oh, I'm spending the night at my friend's house. But really, he would go to Maddie's house and watch it. Mm -hmm. And so there's a scene where she's like, I'm running away. Let's go. You're coming with me. And he's too scared. He's like, I can't, I can't do it. So he goes to the kid who he's pretending to stay at's house and is like, talks to his mom and is like, you have to tell my parents that I'm lying so that I get grounded and I don't have to go with Maddie. Mm -hmm. The mom is played by Tara, which A, they took her name for the Pinko Pig and B, uh, or sorry, it's played by the woman who plays Tara in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yes. So namesake is already a reference, but then also it's Amber Benson who played Tara McClay in in Buffy. And I was like, as soon as she opened the door, I was like, oh, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know it was based on Buffy before you went in? I didn't. No. As I was watching, I was like, okay. <laughs> definitely inspired by something i know yeah <laughs> and then yeah i saw amber and i was like oh my god tara and then i knew i was gonna cry even harder <laughs> it's like why are they putting in my face did you see <laughs> there was an interview with mm -hmm. jane schoenbrunn and a couple of the cast i think where they said that the movie inspirations for like the movie as a whole as opposed to the tv shows Mm -hmm. were the mask, obviously. That might have been a joke, though, because they also said liar, liar. So that might have been a joke. But um, Scream. Okay. They straight up said that Scream was also an influence. I love that. Because, yeah, very 90s vibe. They definitely had a lot of humor in this. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I could definitely see how they pulled from that. Yeah. But it might have been because the, the kid that plays the son of the mask is in Scream. So that also might have been a joke. But... For your sake, we'll say that it wasn't. I feel like you, you could definitely see some influences to a lot of, like, 90s media. Yeah, totally. 
Uh, well, it was filmed in 35. Mm -hmm. The whole thing. And then the scenes for the Pink Opaque were then transferred to VHS. And that is what is produced on screen is the 35 millimeter transferred to VHS. Yeah. And Betamax. Yeah. Which is fun. Which I, I, oh, I loved it. Yeah. So fun. Yeah. And they also had a lot of, not a lot, but a few 90s stars who made little cameos in it. Mm -hmm. um, Michael C. Morona and Danny Tamborelli, who were on The Adventures of Pete and Pete on Nickelodeon. They show up for a little bit. Fred Durst, the <laughs> lead singer of Limp Bizkit, was he plays Owen's dad. <laughs> crazy, crazy. Yeah, I didn't even recognize him. I mean, well, he was I mean, always partially obscured. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in an interview with Vulture, Jane Schoenbrunn said that their inclusions were less about reverence and more about being haunted by familiar faces. Yes. And I, th I thought that was like a really smart touch of including faces that a lot of people who grew up in the 90s would recognize and be like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I know them. Yeah, and, one, and I think that really worked because one thing that really struck me about this film was that the dad was, I mean, for me, very much the scary, like, the, like, he was very scary. Yeah. He was very menacing, and that I related a lot to that. I mean, my biological dad, mm -hmm. anger issues, um, and it's like an eggshell parent mm. is what was being, and I can only imagine if that is coming from like a place of Jane knowing that growing up and being trans and having not come out yet and knowing that they are trans and their parent is an eggshell parent, that's fucking terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. So all the scenes with the dad were very <laughs> uncomfortable for me. I mean, the whole movie was uncomfortable, but that especially. Yeah. And Jane also kind of talked about that. Like they touched on that a little bit in an interview. Um, mm -hmm. cause they kind of talked about how they wanted to include little bits of things. Like they didn't want it to just be about, Oh, Owen has an angry dad and that's a stand in explanation for something. Mm -hmm. Um, so they kind of said, if I, the idea was more, if I show you these three things and then continue to explore what I'm exploring at the center of the film, what is your relationship to the exposition? Yeah. And Jane themselves even was like, maybe that's a little pretentious, but <laughs> that yeah. was kind of the vibe that they were going for when making the film. So yeah, and, and they I kind of like an that amazing too. job. Yeah, because it's definitely I feel like they gave us enough information, mm -hmm. but also left enough up that you can interpret it in a meaningful way to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Also, the font they used for the pink opaque is the same font used for the opening credits of Buffy. <laughs> oh, you were really holding that one in, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> I do really love the tattoo. The, mm. like, super cute. Little ghost of glasses. Yeah. The visuals of this movie were incredible. Yeah. Huge fan. Yeah. Mr. Melancholy. <laughs> Also a very unnerving scene. <laughs> I was going to say smash, but then I, pull, I pulled back. It was like, maybe calm down for a second. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> if, if it helps, I was going to say it more as a joke. <laughs> no. Um, well. Well. <laughs> <laughs> We can't see our faces. It's a podcast. <laughs> uh, for anybody listening. She's the making suggestive faces. <laughs> Me? Yeah. You started it. <laughs> <laughs> I did it again. <laughs> oh, God. Um, no, that was the scariest part of the whole movie. The, like, animation yeah. and then un- animation and it that was it was yeah it was very unnerving mm -hmm. um yeah the like zoom in grainy picture like part of his face moving and, like, it was yeah i want a pink opaque show 
I need it. I don't. I need it. Maybe that'll be like their next short films. They'll just do a series of, oh my God. Jane will do a series of short films based on the Pink Opaque. Which, by the way, the Pink Opaque is named after an album by a Scottish rock duo. Yeah. <laughs> I have never heard of, but they're like an 80s, 90s rock duo from Scotland. Yeah, with the co- Cocteau twins? Cocteau twins? Cocteau something yeah it's a great name i want to see it give it to me rachel (laughs) (laughs) show me to me please (laughs) did you know this movie was produced by emily stone don't ever call her by her (laughs) she wants to be called by her government name you know her she's credited as emma stone (laughs) i know but she wants to be called emily Okay, then she can change her stage name. She's trying to, and people aren't respecting it. (laughs) She hasn't yet. It's all over the news. Oh, Emily. It's like when Anne Hathaway was like, call me Annie. And it's like, no, I don't know you. What do you mean? (laughs) (laughs) And that did not last. Well, I don't know. I've never seen her in real life. Maybe people do call her Annie in real life. She said that she was like, oh, like when fans come up to me, I want them to call me Annie because that's what I go by. And I'm like, not to us, you don't. Well, it's the, it's the opposite, though, in this case. Like, Emma feels like the nicknamey. Like, Emily is more professional. Okay, yeah, you know yeah. What I mean? yeah, yeah. To me, yeah, I don't yeah. Know. Anyway. Yeah. She wants to be called Emily. I'm going to call her Emily. Doesn't, it, it doesn't feel right, though. But it's like when Snoop Dogg wanted to be called Snoop Lion. Like, it's just not happening. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was. Wasn't that a marketing joke, though? Like, it's not a marketing tactic. No, probably. I think that was a marketing thing. I just feel like celebrities can't. You can't just change your name like that. Just off the cuff. What do you mean? Like Machine Gun Kelly wanting to go by Machine now. I. Or Machine I... Kelly. Is it Machine or Machine Kelly? I don't know. I don't ever think about that man <laughs> well there was some there was some tiktok of like a guy saying take the gun out of your name because it's promoting violence or whatever yeah and he was like that i'll do it and then i think he i don't know yeah i feel like he just wanted to go by like the machine or something like that i don't know the guy's that's what i will not respect <laughs> i don't Sorry. respect him as a person or as his name <laughs> I do pop culturally enjoy following his on again, off again relationship with Megan Kelly, though. Reg- that's not her name. <laughs> Megan Kelly. No, Megan, Megan Fox? Fox? Megan Kelly. What the fuck? That would be that would be some pop culture. Oh, crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's odd. Why is her name even in my brain? I don't know. And to conflate that with megan fox i'm gonna be honest i love megan fox but her being with him made me be like i don't know about that megan what's wrong with him he's like said on multiple occasions that minors are hot ew that's how the whole like him and eminem feud happened because he was talking about eminem's daughter and how hot she was when she was like 14 years old jesus christ and then he was talking about how like i think it was kylie jenner like years ago he was like, I wouldn't wait until she's 18. I don't care. Like, ask any man. They're not going to wait until she's 18. Jesus Christ. He should be in jail. Uh- <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, he's gross, gross. Maybe he does deserve Megan Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why I said it. A Freudian slip. Yeah, who he should be with. Who's Megan Kelly? She's like a journalist. Was well, she the conservative one? She spells her name really dumb. Yeah. I don't, Sorry. I mean, that's not her fault, to be clear. <laughs> that's how her parents felt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They deserve each other. <laughs> Based solely on the way she spells her name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Back to the movie we're talking about, because I don't want to talk about the machine <laughs> <laughs> the machine just kidding Disgusting. um apparently one of the producers of the film we don't know if it was emily or not but <laughs> one of the 
producers apparently told uh, Jane Schoenber- Schoenbrunn uh, that they needed to rewrite Owen's character because he was too passive and the producer thought that the audience was going to be convinced that Owen murdered Maddie when Maddie disappeared, which is crazy because that thought never even crossed my mind. <laughs> well, was it rewritten? Did they rewrite it? I don't think so. Oh, okay. Um, because Jane had said that his passiveness was vi- like key to the story. And so I think they kept that. I mean, he was very passive in the, in the movie. So I yeah. think that they kept that in. And yeah, I don't know. I just never thought that he hurt her. Did you think that? No, the only thing I thought about <laughs> his character was that maybe he was on the spectrum. Oh, okay. Yeah, I feel like that is fair. Which, if he is, I'm so glad it was not spelled out. Because mm. that would have felt gimmicky. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like that. there were a few kind of things that were touched on like that. Like, it's kind of hinted at that he might be asexual because he's like... Mm-hmm. Do you like boys? Do you like girls? Yeah. I like TV shows. <laughs> yeah. Not any interest in that type of like romantic mm-hmm. um, exploration. Yeah. Also, one last connection to Buffy that I'm going to make, which maybe you should like <laughs> earmuffs. <laughs> I mean, I've seen the most important episode of Buffy. That's true. That, I also cried during that episode. Um <laughs> <laughs> For those wondering, if you've seen Buffy, she watched the body. Um, <laughs> so the fruit punch. Don't call it that episode. <laughs> <laughs> it's the body episode. Okay. Um, but anyways, so in the movie, season six, episode one of the Pink Opaque, because it gets canceled at season five. So then Maddie comes back and starts talking about like what season six was going to be. Uh, it was supposed to include the girls being brought back from the midnight realm and climbing their way out of their graves and season six episode one of buffy the vampire slayer is about buffy climbing her way out of her grave (laughs) love that yeah i like that i do too (laughs) yeah we know (laughs) you will too once you watch it i need to okay when (laughs) i'll start it as soon as I'm done finishing watching the Transformers movies with my husband. <laughs> that is not, I thought you were going to say Teen Wolf. <laughs> I feel like I, I feel like I got to the part in Teen Wolf that you meant for me to stop at. No, you definitely didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fine. After Teen Wolf and Transformers. I know you didn't because you were keeping me updated and you all, you did, you didn't even finish 3A. No. 3B is where the money is at, Katie. <laughs> okay. All right. Is it show, that show's done, right? Teen Wolf? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. If I can't live in my TV shows, I'm going to have to make you. <laughs> so. I'm into it. Yeah. Well, what else? Oh, I'll, I have another thing. Mm. The director commissioned 16 original songs from their favorite bands for the film soundtrack. So everything from the soundtrack, which has... The coolest fucking vinyl. I don't know if you've seen the vinyl for it on A24.com. It's pink and it's got Candyman. Candyman? Ice Cream Man? The Ice Cream Man on it. What's his name? Damn, they got the licensing? No. (laughs) Not Candyman. Uh, I think it was Mr. Sprinkles. Mr. Sprinkles. Well, they call him Ice Cream Man. Owen calls him Ice Cream Man at one point, I think. But anyway. Mr. Sprinkly. Mr. Sprinkly. Mr. Sprinkly. Mr. Sprinkly. Yeah, Mr. Sprinkly is on the vinyl, and it's like this bright pink. Oh, it's so cute. I love it. I love that. I want it. I've been thinking about, I told my family that for my birthday, I want a good record player. And they're like, do you have any records? And I'm like, why would I buy records if I don't have a record player? Like, what? Yeah. Um. Anyway, I've been thinking about, like, what do I want my first vinyl to be? Oh, and that could That's be That's so exciting. Yeah. I it's, it's probably gonna be the the like amber version of um Twilight New Moon soundtrack, but if I'm being honest. Stay true to yourself. Yeah, I should. You're right. I didn't get to choose my first vinyl. <laughs> Was it gif- gifted to you? Yes, I bought a record player because I got all of my parents' record or, yeah, records that yeah, when my dad passed away, they he had them all, so I got them all. Nice. Yeah. 
A lot of ABBA. Lots of ABBA. A lot of ABBA. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of ABBA in there. And I love it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. ABBA, Peter Gabriel, Fleetwood Mac. A lot of Fleetwood Mac and Stevie Nicks, which... Experienced best on vinyl. Stevie Nicks. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then now, Harry Styles. I do have Harry Styles. I have two of his records. I love Harry Styles. Yeah. That was our first concert together. It was our only concert together. Don't say that. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Our first of many. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually want, I've been trying to get, um, there's a musical episode of Buffy and I want that on vinyl, but it's, it's sold out immediately. And then yeah. like, it's on eBay for like $200. So $200. Bro, people love Buffy. <laughs> People it's a vinyl. great musical episode, too. I listen to it on Spotify all the time. What's the best musical episode? Once More With Feeling. On... In Buffy. That's a, that's a Taylor Swift reference. No, it's not because it came out in the 90s. Or, well, I guess well, it's probably 2000s, but... No, I mean, like, Taylor Swift made that reference. Makes a reference. Great. Funny. It's a great episode. That. Okay, all right. I believe you. I didn't mention what? Taylor Swift? That she when says that. Ever? She says that, like very menacingly and it's like the most iconic lyric in the song she says that in one of her songs on their new album oh i'm gonna be honest i wasn't like the first like couple minutes of each song and i yeah. couldn't get into any of you them you didn't even so. get to any of the bridges oh i did it just anyway. wasn't for me i'm so sorry yes weird but anyway what are we <laughs> even talking about oh um <laughs> yeah the director commissioned all the songs yeah the soundtrack slaps me. too yeah it's very good yeah the song I don't think it's called I Saw the TV Glow, but where they say I Saw the TV Glow is very, very good. Yeah. Isn't that where Phoebe Bridgers has a cameo, too? Is she in the movie? I'm pretty sure she's the, like, bass player in the band. I mean, I know she's on one of the songs, but I didn't know if she was on that song. Oh. I could have swore it was her, but also, I'm not, like, super familiar with Phoebe Bridgers' face, so maybe I was mistaken. (laughs) Well, I thought she was the bass player. Could definitely be wrong. Sounds. She's yeah. credited in the cast with the other band members. Yeah. She's I not credited that... as a band member, but she's credited as herself well, with, the, like, in the middle of all the other band members. So. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm listening to this song right now. It's called Claw Machine. Oh, okay. That's the one that she's credited on. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that's the song that you're talking about that they're playing in the movie. Yeah. I think it was her, but I, I, I don't know. Somebody who knows better maybe can tell me if that was her face or not. It was, it was a blonde girl. I was like, Oh, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, should we rate it? Okay. All right. How scary did you think it was? I gave it a one, but I think I'm going to amend that to a 1.5. Because it was very, like, unnerving. Yeah. It, was it wasn't thing. outright, yeah, it wasn't outright scary, but it did kind of leave you with, like, a feeling of dread. hmm And so I think it deserves a little credit for that. Yeah. What about you? I agree. I gave it a two. Okay. Because it was menacing. It was. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was just standing there menacingly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was uncomfortable and. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um. How sexy did you think it was? I didn't. Yeah. Not even a little. Okay. But I gave it a one. Yeah. You? I gave it a 1.5. Only okay. just because of like the vibe, the aesthetics, the 90s. You know what I mean? Uh, no. <laughs> oh. But... It's See, like the I... same way you thought Annihilation's aesthetic was hot. It is. Okay, so this is an aesthetic that's hot to me. Like neon colors and 90s vibes and grainy film. (laughs) Okay. That's hot. Okay. (laughs) Okay. How fucked up did you think it was? I gave it a 1.5, but I'm also wondering if I should add it up just because it really, it impacted me for sure. (laughs) While watching it, I didn't necessarily think anything was super fucked up. Mm -hmm. But I think like, the way it impacted me, I do have to give it a little, a little credit for that. Yeah. 
And that's one thing I struggle with when we're rating these things is like, okay, do I put the impact under fucked up or do mm. I put the impact under sexy? Do I put the, like, do I put it under overall? I think it depends on how it impacts you. Yeah. This impacted me in a fucked up place. <laughs> so yeah. That it goes there and I'll give it a two. Yeah. Okay. What about you? I also gave it a two. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Yeah. I mean, it generally when I'm reading things fucked up, I'm thinking like, not this. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> Which I guess I don't really have to explain much more than that. But <laughs> <laughs> it, it definitely is a movie that gets under your skin. Yeah. It's unnerving. At least it got under mine. Yeah. Maybe some people are built different and they're better, but like, <laughs> not me. I mean, I would hope that most people can relate to this in a way that it's a little See, fucked up. But then I think, like, my sister would probably watch this and ha be like, that was dumb. I just wasted an hour and a half. Your sister doesn't strike me as the kind of person to watch and critique movies of this That's nature. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's not, she's not really a horror movie fan at all. Um, overall... What did you give it? I went I went back and still, forth. Still a deciding? Lot. Yeah, I went I went back and forth a lot. I landed on a three. Okay. I was gonna split the I was gonna cut it down the middle at a two point five because it was almost unaccessible for a lot of people, and I think accessibility is important in a movie. Mm. But I, I do think that it's accessible to everyone. I think everybody can find, learn, appreciate something from this movie. Yeah. Um and it was beautifully shot. I did love the aesthetic. I didn't think that made it sexy. But <laughs> the 90s aesthetic definitely did something for me. Not sexually. <laughs> like some people. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just... It's a good movie. I will probably watch it again later. Not mm -hmm. now. I need to give it some time. Yeah. Because it was really uncomfortable to watch especially um what's his name justice smith no no no. well yeah i guess no. yeah are you talking about the ice cream man mr sprinkly the moon no. guy no M mr melancholy no who was the main the main character that's owen For justice smith owen owen yeah justice smith. yeah well i was gonna say <laughs> owen's performance but it's really justice smith's performance which is why i was like oh yeah i guess that works it was it was very hard to watch. Yeah. Because you really feel for him the entire movie. Like, uncomfortably, you are put in his shoes and just, like... And maybe that's what was why I ranked it what I did for Fucked Up, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but it did affect, like, my overall score of the movie. Like, it was so uncomfortable to be put in his shoes the way that you were. Got it. That brought it down a little bit? No, no. That, oh. that brought it up. Well, you've said that but, three is a bad score. So I'm thinking you did not like this movie, right? Because that's your, you've said that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, three is a 60. So you hated it. I didn't hate what? it. <laughs> I didn't hate it. I, I did, I did like it. And I think that, that I will watch it again, but it was so uncomfortable to watch. I, I won't wa be watching it again anytime soon. Got it. So what brought the score down? What did you not like about the film? The, it, that it's not totally accessible. It was a little big brain. Okay. You don't like an artsy movie? I mean, I do like some artsy movies. I liked this movie. You know, you hated it. That's what you say to me every time I rate something three. <laughs> no. It's different. Oh, it's different when you rate it a three? Yes. Okay, got it. Because you go out and rate... You, you like these kinds of movies. That's... What? Horror movies, I mean. Yeah. I don't think three is the best Yeah, so more. when you're like, oh, a five. Like, okay. You like horror movies. You know? My fives don't mean anything to you? No, they do. <gasps> oh, we're fighting now. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you don't like horror movies, so a three is a good rating for you. No, I do like horror movies, but it's not well, the same. Well, now what's the truth, Kate? <laughs> it's not the same. You're forcing me to watch them. <laughs> you you asked for this. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the what I'm trying to say. The amount of contradictions you've just made to yourself. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Crazy. I, I did like this movie, but it was not the best movie I've ever seen. That's Got all. It. That's all that it is. That's fair. That's all that it is. 
<laughs> and it was it was really hard to watch. It was, yeah. I'm honestly just kind Which, of giving you a little shit. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thanks. It's just it just it makes the rewatchability. You're always the rewatchability one. Oh, it's got rewatchability. That's what you say. Yeah, I do like rewatchability. And this does not have that because I don't want to go through that again. Soon, you know? Yeah. Okay. That's all I'm gonna say. Great. Thanks. Okay, now your turn. Um I do want to watch this again, no doubt about it. I'm ready to get hurt again. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I actually really like this. I give it a four out of five. Um, <laughs> I I I don't know what happened, but actually surprised I made it through the recording without sobbing. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like, I couldn't stop. It felt so personal and so relatable and like and it wasn't even made for like it wasn't even about that, right? But I think that's like the beauty of the film is that it was made as this allegory for one thing, but it's still relatable to a lot of different people. And yeah, I don't know. It gave me an existential crisis and I really liked it. And I liked the visuals and I don't know if I'm ever going to stop thinking about him sobbing at the birthday party and then apologizing to people. For yeah. It. Like, just... That is exactly what I'm talking about. Him walking him... down the aisle saying sorry was so fucking hard to watch. And him struggling to breathe and like that being such a relatable thing when you're like not being who you truly are and like just a physical manifestation of that. And I just, I mm -hmm. don't know. I want to go see it again. <laughs> I really liked it. Fucking masochist over here. Yeah, maybe. I have enough going on. I don't need to be a masochist in that regard. <laughs> but you know what? If you got to feel something, you got to feel something. I, I probably shouldn't. But <laughs> you should sleep instead. I, yeah, that's step one. <laughs> I'm going to get a good night's sleep. And then step two, I get hurt again. Yeah. <laughs> I go watch this movie. Next time I'm just going to sob in the theater. I don't care who's looking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Would you survive? Nobody died. This wasn't even a horror movie. They didn't mention that at all during our 54 minutes conversation of this horror movie. But I don't I don't even really think this is a horror movie. I do. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, not in like the typical sense that you think of it, but I think it's unnerving and... Yeah, it's a scary drama. Has that feeling of dread. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a horror drama. Okay. But yeah, I definitely think it has elements of horror in it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Would you survive? Yeah, I think so. Kind of depends on, like, your interpretation of it, right? Yeah, I mean... Is Owen actually trapped? Is he slowly dying in this coffin? Being buried under, under the ground? So I'm going to be honest, if someone came up to me in my life right now and was like... You're actually in Buffy, and you're buried, and you have to go bury yourself again to get out. I'd be like, okay, buddy. <laughs> Step away from me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that was his reaction. Yeah. But it's also, I mean, the whole movie is kind of metaphorical, so I think, I think we can give ourselves a pass and say that we survived. <laughs> yeah. Well, and survive and thrive are two different things. That's true. I would survive. I don't think I'd survive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Do you want to predict next week's movie? Do I get to? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I do. Maybe I'm a little ahead of myself. Yeah, you are. Oh. As a behind the scenes, Katie has already watched uh, the, the films we will be talking about in our 75th episode. But... We're only on episode 72 right now. This is episode 72. Oh, jeez. So, yeah, yeah, we got a We got a few in between. Uh, Seriously. <laughs> just two more episodes. Yeah, but that's, that's a fun uh, little spoiler, though. Yeah. Take that, take that for what you will. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so next week, we are going to be talking about the movie Tremors. Oh, the earthquake movie. The earthquake cave movie. The Earthquake Quake, I can't say that. The Earthquake Cave movie. Tell yeah. me about it. 
Uh, oh, I've been like really wanting to watch this one. People talk about it on TikTok all the time, but I skip. Oh, oh nice. I'm so proud yeah. of you. But I'm pretty sure it's Cave Earthquake. Great. And there's monsters? No, I don't think so. So they, they yeah, so it's um, the world is struck by almost endless earthquakes, constant earthquakes. All the time. And the only places that have held up are caves. Solid. Yeah. So they have to go into the caves. And you know what? There are monsters. Where. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Where an ancient society of beings mm -hmm. have been able to survive. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? This was a dinosaur movie. It's not, though. <laughs> but that would be really cool. <laughs> have been able to survive underground because the tremors don't hit below the crust yeah of the earth so very similar to that other cave movie we watched there's this like the descent yeah there's this like pale they've been able to live underground yeah but now mm -hmm. the tremors are coming to affect the caves so they have to like fight their way who's going to be the ones to go up above ground is it going to be the modern day humans that are went to the caves to escape or the ancient species of whatever who's gonna get out and it's exactly. gonna be the humans it's gonna be the humans because i think there's a sequel great tremors is not about earthquakes uh is it about <laughs> caves it is not about caves um it is what a the monster comedy horror film oh that sounds fun starring kevin bacon <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Oh, shit. We talked about it during Friday the 13th. Yeah. Creature feature? It is a creature feature. Is Kevin the creature featured? No. Oh. Kevin's a man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think, I think you might be able to argue that the creatures are a little dinosaur-y. Not in appearance, but... <laughs> Ancient and survived a meteor? Ancient. <laughs> Are they aliens? I don't think so. There's one thing I, I love. It's an ancient ever, alien. Like, I don't know if they ever like fully. I'm sure they do quite a few Tremors movies. Are they lizardy? Is that why Seven. they're dinosaur-y? No, they're just, they're old. They've been here a long time. That sounds like dinosaurs. That's why I said you could make an argument. Okay. I'm into it. Yeah. It's funny how everything I was sure about is not what it is. And everything I was like, oh, it's probably not that is definitely what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a hundred percent. Cute. But yeah, this movie is was made in the nineties. It came out in nineteen ninety. And we just did a movie reminiscing on the nineties. So what perfect timing. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. Cute. All right. Well, we'll chat about it next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> sorry for that. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening. Thank you. I'm sorry you had to hear all of that. And also, we'll see you next week when we talk about tremors. Yeah. Bye. Bye.